this is another full lawyer employment act case <clears throat> we're here this afternoon on syringa networks llc against the idaho department of administration and others uh, appearing on behalf of the Idaho Department of Administration, and I understand we'll both argue, are Merlin Clark and Steve Schossberger. Uh, on behalf of Quest Communications, uh, Steve uh, Preferment, did I get that right? Uh, we'll argue and Steve Thomas will appear. Uh, I don't know if we get to mention Phil Obrack since he went behind the barrier, but uh, he is appearing today on behalf of ENA Services LLC, and Robert Patterson will argue. Uh, on behalf of the respondent, David Lombardi will argue. Melody McQuaid will ride shotgun. Any preliminary matters to bring before the court? No. no. Uh, Mr. Schossberger, I understand you'll be first. Uh, Mr. Patterson. Oh, Mr. Patterson, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Police Court, I'm Bob Patterson of the Nashville, Tennessee Bar. I appreciate your indulgence in allowing me to be heard today on behalf of my clients, ENA and Education Networks of America. I begin with, which, with what I believe is probably the simplest of the issues before the court. This court ruled in the opinion that we've all referred to as Syringa 1 that my client was dismissed. Most importantly, in its conclusion, it ruled the dismissal of all counts of the complaint except count three, seeking to set aside the state's contract with Quest on the ground that it was awarded in violation of applicable statutes. Every other dismissal was firm, affirmed. I'm before the court asking and arguing that once this court dismisses a party, it stays dismissed. Accordingly, I'm asking the court in terms of relief that it reverse the trial court's denial of our motion to dismiss and dismiss ENA from the case. Now, the fact is that the procedural history of this case as it relates to my client illuminates some of the other issues that our co-counsel will present. When this case was filed in December of 2009, it did not challenge the award. It did not challenge the amendment to ENA. And the plaintiff who filed this suit had an obligation under the rules to include within that lawsuit all of its claims as related to the same transaction and occurrence. That was the status of the pleadings. That was the status of the pleadings when the parties filed their motions for summary judgment. That was the status of the pleadings when it came before this court. And that was the status of the pleadings when this court dismissed as to all theories other than a single theory on which it found the court, the plaintiff, might have standing. It's important to remember that this case went up the first time on summary judgment. So when this court ruled that there was standing, which was the only issue before the court, it had to assume that the facts then pled and alleged by the plaintiff be held in the view most favorable to the plaintiff. And accordingly, doing that, this court found that the plaintiff had standing as to that single theory, but as only to that theory. So ENA is out of the lawsuit. We're dismissed. We stay dismissed. The case gets sent back down to the trial court. This is March of 2013. From March of 2013 until July of 2014, there were, by my count, about 95 pleadings issued in that lawsuit, and my client had never been served, had not been brought back in the lawsuit. In July of 2014, we were served with the amended complaint. And all of a sudden, this lawsuit has transformed itself from something that this court had remanded into something much, much broader with many more material facts at issue. Instead of a case that focused only on the amendment to Quest, the lawsuit now focused on the amendment to ENA and Quest, and apparently focused on the original awards. So understand the position that my client has been in for the five years of this contract. It entered into a contract. It responded to an RFP. The state accepted our contract. The RFP was an offer. The award was an acceptance. We had a contract. We were bound to perform that contract. A lawsuit was filed months later. That lawsuit did not challenge our contract. Accordingly, for five years, 
<coughs> ENA services performed that contract. They engineered the networks that were required. They put this in place. They built it for the school system. They performed it for the school system. They rendered services to the contract as it was obliged to do because of the contract that had been entered into. The lawsuit, as it focuses on the amendment to Quest, focused only on that time period from January 29th when the award issued through February 28th when the amendments issued. The expanded lawsuit now challenges the original award on the theory that the amendments changed what was intended by the RFP. And in order to do that, you have to look prior to January 29th and see what the state was doing when it issued the RFP. And as this court noted in its opinion, one of the challenges was that as a result of the amendments, there was a lack of competition. And in order to look at that period, you have to look at how the contract was actually actuated in that period after February 28th. 2009. So the fact of the matter is, this law, the amendment was not an immaterial change to the lawsuit. It vastly expanded the scope of the lawsuit. Well, what was our response? We responded with a motion to dismiss. We responded with an argument that the doctrines of race judicata and judicial estoppel say exactly what they think you think they say, which is once you're dismissed, you're dismissed. That was heard by the court at the same time that the other motions were issued and that other motions for summary judgment were argued. And in the same opinion, in November of 2014, the court did a couple of things, trial court did a couple of things that were really kind of unusual. In the space of one opinion, they transformed our motion to dismiss into a motion for summary judgment. Now under Rule 12, if you transform a motion to dismiss to a motion for summary judgment, you have a right to be heard on those facts. And yet, in the same opinion where the court transformed our motion to dismiss to a motion for summary judgment, the court found against us on the motion and ruled in favor of a motion for summary judgment that we would never had an opportunity to respond to. That motion was filed before we were brought back into the lawsuit. We were never given notice by the trial court that it was going to transform our motion to dismiss into a motion for summary judgment. And the fact of the matter is, our motion to dismiss did not go to the merits of the case. We never argued that the amended complaint failed to state a claim upon which relief could be granted. We argued that the doctrines of race judicata and judicial estoppel said that it couldn't be asserted against our client. Well, that's why we're here before the court today. The judge, trial court judge, in the same uh, uh, ruling held that it was illegal relies on this case of queering versus queering, which I would submit is totally inapplicable to the facts of our case. Queering involved a wife who extorted a contract from her husband to keep quiet about a crime so that she could get, uh, so that he could limit his exposure to his family. In our case, if there's a bad actor here, and we deny that the state did anything wrong, the bad actor here would be the state. And if the court holds our contract illegal, then what the court is doing is denying innocent parties, ENA and CenturyLink, the benefit of that contract. If you stand back and look what's at, at what's really happened here, what's happened is that Syringa on remand was entitled to do over their lawsuit, to start over with a brand new lawsuit, one that expanded the theories of liability, one that goes to facts that have never been developed, facts about the development of the RFP, facts about how the contract was actuated, facts that this court has never been presented with and has no record upon which to rule. On that basis, procedurally, we're in a box. We're either on remand, that case was either limited or it had to be retried. As to ENA, however, I would assert that there is no box. This court ruled that my client was dismissed. The plaintiff had an obligation to bring all of the claims against my client that arose out of the same transaction or occurrence in the same lawsuit. It never sued us to have our awards declared invalid. When this court says a party's dismissed, it ought to stay dismissed. And for that reason, I ask this court to reverse the trial court's denial of our motion to dismiss. Thank you, Mr. Patterson. May please the court. When we were here on February 22, 2013, SPPOs 1308 and 1309 were legal. 
the multiple awards ENA and Quest fully complied with the provisions of Idaho Code Section 6757.18a. There is no question because Syringa conceded their lawfulness. No challenge could have ever been made to these two contracts because Syringa did not make any administrative challenge under Idaho Code Section 6757.33. Syringa was and is barred from challenging the issuance or legality of SBPO 1308 and 1309 for failure to exhaust administrative remedies. The how district much, court. Uh, how much money did uh, the Department of Administration pay out on the original uh, contracts? I don't know, Your Honor. I don't believe that's in the record anywhere of how much. As I understand it, uh, the charges didn't start to get made until after the contracts were amended. So nothing was paid under the original SBPOs or whatever they are. Your Honor, that is a factual dis dispute <coughs> within the record on remand and is disputed within the affidavit of Greg Zickow, which was never month, applied. Within the one month period between the issuance of the contracts and the and the amendments you're saying there may have been something paid no your honor i'm not saying that what i'm saying is between the award january 28th 2010 and the so-called document called amendment number one february 26 2010 the ien had not yet been implemented however starting in the late summer early fall of 2010 upon the implementation the evidence in the record, which Judge Owen on the motions for summary judgment completely ignored, is that none of these service orders were made or placed pursuant to the so-called document called Amendment Number 1. Instead, all of the service orders for E-rate services for the schools was placed through SBPO 1309 to ENA. The state agencies placed their orders to Quest under SBPO 1308 and that these so-called amendments were merely a statement of declaration by Laura Hill as to the roles and responsibilities of the party. However, the evidence was never vetted to ever in the lower court on remand to determine whether or not they were, there was a lawful implementation, whether or not the amendments were followed, whether or not, which was the burden of proof of Syringa in the first place on remand, challenging the so-called document to show that it's even a valid contract. It was not, we submit, and the evidence in the record, which was also ignored by the lower court, establishes that there was no consideration, that they weren't signed by both parties, which is required by the state of Idaho, and that it was not a lawful amendment. If anything, again, it was just a declaration. It was an intention of the roles and responsibilities. And I'd like to go to that also. In terms of post-remand, we have a record on summary judgment. We now finally have some evidence in the record. When we were here before this court on February 22, 2013, this court was left with the impression, based upon the oral argument, that Syringa was totally shut out and cut out from receiving any of the IEN telecommunication services. Not true. The record now shows this honorable court that as of April 2011 and beginning back in March of 2011, which was just a year after the implementation, Syringa had been negotiating with Quest the state of Idaho had been requesting for Syringa to join the network in high-cost locations where it had its member companies, and it could only be the one that could service those locations. As of April 24, 2011, Syringa signed a master services agreement with Quest to be a subcontractor under ENA's SBPO 1309. It freely and voluntarily joined the IEN at that point and started acting as a contributed vendor and member of the IEN as of April 2011. Ironically, well, that made the contracts as amended legal and in compliance that, with Idaho's procurement law. That waived any right and that stopped from Syringa from continuing to make the argument that they were illegal <coughs> because they then started joining the very contracts that they were alleging were illegal, receiving benefits from them. And in fact, between 2011 and 2013, as established in the record, we're paid almost $1.4 million. And we know they continue to accept those benefits and they continue to participate in the IEN and service, be the exclusive provider in those areas, all the way up until January of 2015. So we can easily double that amount. They were paid over $3 million. This isn't chump change. This isn't any small amount of services that Syringa offered. But again, this court was left 
it was not given, as Paul Harvey said, the rest of the story. And now, though, we do have the rest of the story, and we do know that they did join, they were a part of it, and again, we would submit that the district court erred in not following those equitable doctrines of waiver and estoppel and unclean hands in looking at Syringa's motion for summary judgment. And so I take it then if, if a contract is void ab initio, if somebody gets some uh, subcontract benefit for it, they can't complain about it. Absolutely not. And that's going to go to my next point of the doctrine of mootness and ripeness. As of April 24, 2011, when Syringa freely and voluntarily joined, let's look back to their prayer for relief back in the complaint, December 15, 2009. Their sole prayer was to void the amendment number one to Quest. And their other claim, or the requested relief, was to enjoin Quest from doing any service work for the IEM. What happened? Between December 15, 2009 and February 2015, when the legislature defunded it, did Syringa ever file a Rule 65 motion to enjoin Quest from doing that work? No. They allowed the network, the pipeline, to be built out. It's the exact same situation as this court ruled in the uh, Zetbinger case, I'm mispronouncing it, but where the pipeline was built out and then it was, it was too late. There was no more remedy to be established. Under the Idaho Declaratory Judgment Act, Section 10-1211, the remedy has to be available for the aggrieved party all the way through trial. But yet, as of April 2011, they weren't enjoying Quest. They joined up with Quest and were accepting work from them. They were doing their work for the IEM. Then additionally, post-remand, as of July 2014, the parties, by amendment number four to Quest and by, excuse me, by amendment number four to ENA and by amendment number 15 to CenturyLink, mutually rescinded, revoked, canceled, struck, whatever language you want to use, that amendment number one. They took it out of their binder, they ripped it up, and they said, this is no longer in our company records. We're not acting pursuant to it. They said, oh, you can't void an illegal contract. No, it was a modification to a contract. And so either the parties can acknowledge that this document called amendment number one no longer exists because it's created a lot of heartache and argument, or two, to your honor's point, if it was void ab initio, because it, if it did amend uh, to no longer have same or similar property under the statute, then it was void from its existence, and the parties were always acting just under the SBPO's 1308 and 1309. The case law is replete that an illegal modification to a contract does not scathe the underlying lawfulness of the contract, and I believe that was very clear when we were last here. And again, by Syringa's own actions, they're judicially stopped from challenging otherwise. They can never get through the courthouse door to challenge the original SBPOs. They could only challenge amendment number one under the Locksaw Falls case. Lastly, this case is very, very important. As pointed out to your honors, we're not trying to breathe life back into the SBPOs, but the district court committed an error of law in striking the original SBPOs. Significance, USAC, who is the uh, federal administrator of the E-rate funds, upon being told or being provided with this court's opinion back in March of 2013, suspended $11.9 million of reimbursements to the state of Idaho. They're waiting to see whether or not this court says those underlying contracts are lawful. If this court declares they are lawful, then the state, of course, has a very good argument to be able to go back and say, release those funds and also don't make demand for another $14 million coming back to the state. So $25 million is at issue here to the state of Idaho by reason of what is being asked for this appeal. The department respectfully requests that you declare those original SBPOs lawful, that the district court erred in striking them, and that the rest of the case is moot as to amendment number one to Quest. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schausberger. Mr. Perferman. Mr. Chief Justice. Mr. Chief Justice, I'd like to answer your question uh, as best I can with respect to what monies were paid out and when. Um, you are correct that the payments began upon implementation of the IEN, which did not begin as soon as the contracts were left. That took some time, about six months. It was a fluid process. The summary judgment record on remand, limited as though it is, shows, and this is primarily from the, the affidavit of Mr. Greg Zikaw, it begins in the record about 1113. 
And it describes this process as an evolutionary process in which the IEN was developed, the IEN was then implemented, and once there were specific purchase orders made against the contracts, then there were invoices um, submitted and paid. Um, that is supported amply in the record. And so you are correct, is after the amendments number one, as they are styled, that payments were made. But I submit to you that every penny paid to the contractors, ENA and Quest, was paid under the original SBPOs. The amendments number one had no legal effect and it had no factual effect on how this was implemented. What you had was an original statement by Ms. Laura Hill that was the culmination of a series of documents that she was developing, an IEN implementation plan. And what Ms. Hill decided to do uh, was to, at that point, indicate to the parties, because they had to start building this network, what she currently, at that time, envisioned their respective responsibilities would be. Now that is, um, in some way, has shaped how this has been built out, because that vision carries through. However, that vision had never changed what ENA and Quest were responsible to provide to the state of Idaho. The original uh, RFP. Did they each provide backbone and, and uh, internet services? They each provided, not backbone, Quest provided the backbone. Uh, Quest, through Syringa and others, and through its own lines, provided last mile services. ENA provided internet services. And throughout, in the summary judgment record, you have indication that, as we discussed in our briefing, this was a fluid concept. They didn't know how they were going to build this. So they had to do it on the fly. And they got together and figured it out on the fly. And they bought what was needed, as was needed, uh, in order to generate this network. And that was contemplated in the RFP. From day one, it was contemplated that, that the state would choose partners to work with in developing this network and that the services, the implementation, everything about it was subject to change at all times. I believe it's sections 10.2 and 8.9 in the RFP contemplate those very kind, kinds of changes over the life of this contract, plus pricing changes over the life of the contract. And the summary judgment record evidence submitted to the trial court, but ultimately not considered, completely ignored on remand, uh, shows there are a series of I'm focusing on to, to Quest, there are a series of, uh, whether you call them a change order, you call them a, uh, an amendment, or you call them a purchase order, they're called kind of interchangeably, all of these things, you see the evolution of this contract as the state was buying different things at different times as needed, which was expressly contemplated within the RFP. The most important point, however, is that ENA and Quest at all times were contractually bound to provide any or all of the services they offered and contracted to provide as ordered by the state. And it was up to the state to determine what it wanted to buy from each of its vendors. And so amendment number one was simply the initial estimation as to how the state viewed implementing this contract. The summary judgment record, which was not developed before the first hearing in front of this court, which was not developed before the first opinion of this court, the summary judgment record shows that evolution. And I think it's important to understand, because I think the fundal, fundamental error of the trial judge here upon remand was to treat this court's determination on standing, which is a threshold determination made on the pleadings. And this court, in fact, said at page five, 506, of Syringa 1, that Syringa has alleged a distinct and palpable injury not suffered by Idaho citizens. That Syringa has, uh, that that injury is alleged to have been caused by the challenged conduct and that that injury can be addressed by judicial relief. Those were allegations. And those allegations were made on a very limited record. When we go back and look at the timing of the original decision on standing and failure to exhaust that was issued um, below, the complaint in this case was filed in mid-December 2009. There was motions practiced for the next couple of months, and the Department of Administration's motion to dismiss for lack of standing and failure to exhaust was filed in March. There was, discovery was not going on. There was no, there were no depositions being taken. 
there was motions practice in May and June and then argument in June on the Department of Administration's motion. In July, the trial court dismissed counts two and three, the two statutory counts, count three being one of them, for failure to exhaust administrative remedies. I misspoke in my brief and said for lack of standing, but it's for failure to exhaust. At that point, inquiry on these issues ceased. We focused on things like tortious interference and breach of contract, and that's what, how the case developed. And so the record on these issues before the trial court was extremely truncated because there's no need to go into them further. We did not develop all this information and were not offered the opportunity after the initial standing decision, which was based on allegations and not evidence. After that decision, we were not given an opportunity to go back and develop a record. The state tried mightily. It was still, we didn't think we were in the case. Syringa didn't think we were in the case because they didn't serve us with the summary judgment papers that were eventually ruled in their favor and resulted in this second appeal. And so the summary, the fundamental error is that the trial judge did not allow us to develop a record. And on summary judgment, notwithstanding the submission on remand of substantial facts that show how this contract actually played out, how it was developed, the trial court did not look at that evidence. And then furthermore, it took amendments that relate only to the IEN, Idaho Education Network, and said if those amendments, those documents taint this agreement, it taints everything, including state agency work, which the IEN amendments number one didn't even reference. A wholly separate procurement done under the same RFP, but for completely different services. The trial court says it extends to everything. And finally, Syringa has also, here's one place where I think the trial court got it absolutely right. Syringa in its proposed judgment has asked for an order that the state, some portion of it, seek to recover money that was paid to innocent parties under a state procurement contract that is under question for absolutely nothing those innocent parties did. ENA and CenturyLink, under the plain meaning of the word, never received any advancements, not one red cent. Every penny they received was for services actually requested, actually provided, and actually accepted and used by the state, its schools, and its agencies. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Lombardi. Mr. Chief Justice, members of the court. It became evident in March 2013 when this court's decision in Syringa 1 was released that the IEN contracts to question ENA as amended by amendments number one in February 2009 violate the provisions of Chapter 57, Title 67 of the Idaho Code. This court made it clear that amendment number one violated Idaho Code 6757.18.2 because it effectively changed the RFP after the bids had been opened and tried to do in two steps what was prohibited in one. How do you respond to the argument that the amendments were really not amendments, they were just kind of guideposts? Well, Mr. Chief Justice, the amendments were, in fact, amendments to the relationships established by the original contract. And by way of example, I'll refer the court to the description on Syringa's briefing starting at page 9. And the problem was that Mr. Zakow, in fact, testified that ENA did not have the power, did not have the authority under the contracts as amended by amendment number one to contract for telecommunications or Internet services. Quest was the gatekeeper. Quest had to do 
all of it. Now that is absolutely consistent with and is actually directed by amendment number one to Quest contract and amendment number one to ENA's contract. So these were much more, Mr. Chief Justice, much more than guideposts. These were in fact legitimate, or not legitimate, but they were in fact amendments to the contract which governed the conduct of the parties for the next five years. That conduct and those amendments to the contract, which were subsequently ratified, even if not signed at the time, were illegal and void. They violated Idaho Code Section 6757.18.2 because they essentially changed the RFP after the bids had been opened. And they also violated the multiple award statute, Idaho Code Section 6757.18a. The purpose of that is to allow the state to take the benefit of competition, to have the benefit of competition, and to make an award to multiple vendors for same or similar products. But what happened as a consequence of amendments number one is the products were divvied up. And Quest was going to do some, and ENA was going to do some, and they were no longer to be competitors. Amendment number one actually says that ENA and Quest are to be treated as equal partners. On its face, treating ENA and Quest, or any recipients of multiple awards, as equal partners rather than competitors is a violation of the statute. What about the argument that uh, Syringa actually did benefit as a subcontractor or whatever under the contract and now can't uh, challenge it? Mr. Chief Justice, there, there, are, there are multiple levels to that issue. Um, first of all, the amendment to the, or rather the rescission of the contract uh, didn't occur until several years had taken place. Uh, there was no uh, ability to return to the status quo. And so there was really no way even under common law to rescind the stat or to rescind that amendment. But more importantly, the amendment was a violation of Idaho Code section 6757.25 which requires compliance with the procurement statutes of the state. So I don't, I, I'm going to contend that didn't make a difference. And excuse me, because I went off on a, on uh, a, I wasn't entirely responsive to your question. Syringa did contract with Quest after a period of years at the request of the state and at the request of Quest so that uh, services could be provided to uh, what were uh, high risk or high cost school districts. This was after several years of performance under, these under the contracts that were void ab initio. Also, Syringa was not in privity with the state. The state contract is what was the illegal contract. Now, if you take a look at Thomas versus Mercy, or rather Medical Center Physicians, in that case where this rule was discussed, Mr. Thomas had entered into a contract with Medical Center Physicians that gave him some benefits. And then he subsequently turned around and tried to uh, repudiate, essentially, or um, attack that very contract or the process that resulted in that contract. That wasn't the case in this instance. Syringa had a contract with Quest, just like it would have a contract with Quest to provide services in any other areas. It did not benefit in, from the IEN contracts. If Syringa had benefited from the IEN contracts or from the original SBPOs, it would have done so by a direct contract with ENA or with the state of Idaho. The reason I say that is because 
only Quest was allowed by the amendments to obtain telecommunication services. So there was no competition. The contract was illegal, but people needed service. Syringa didn't participate in the Ill illegality of the contract. If anything, it, it provided service so that Quest could perform under the illegal contract. There's been discussion about the facts and what happened and, and guideposts. And I think one thing is very important. First of all, this court's opinion was very clear concerning the violation of Idaho procurement law. Well, did we actually <clears throat> say that there had been a violation of the statute, or were we just saying that there certainly was the appearance and that gave you know, if you gave credence to the allegations, that gave Syringa standing. I mean, is, is this a, an ideal case for application of law of the case? Your Honor, I believe it is an ideal case for application of the doctrine of law of the case. But even if it isn't, the record nonetheless supports the conclusion as a matter of law, that the procurement statutes for the state of Idaho were violated. And I'll tell you why. There is no allegation in the record that the contracts or amendments number one are ambiguous. No one has ever made the contention, well, this, this, doesn't, this isn't understandable. This is an ambiguity in the contract. The contracts exist and are before the court as they were with Syringa 1, <coughs> where the court was free to interpret the contracts as a matter of law. Because they are not ambiguous, they are plain, straightforward, and capable of being interpreted, which is precisely what this court had the ability to do before and has the ability to do this time. The question is not about the conduct and how the parties interpreted the contract. The question directly under 5725 is, do these contracts violate the procurement statutes of the state of Idaho? And they do. This court observed that, in effect, if the allegations were accepted, that the Department of Administration changed the RFP after the bids had been opened. There are no facts that deal with that other than the fact that the scope of work was split and assigned to individual vendors rather than shared between competitors, or rather competed for between competitors. Regarding the allegation of changing this to a motion for summary judgment, Rule 12b allows that to happen if there was a motion to dismiss for failure to state a claim. And it's my understanding that's not what the motion to dismiss was based upon. It was based upon race judicata and estoppel. That is correct, Your Honor. And so I'd like you to respond to their argument that they were not given sufficient time to respond to the merits of the case because of the court's action in changing it to a summary judgment motion. Your Honor, may I, as part of that, first of all, address the question whether they were actually dismissed from the case? Well, that's a different issue. But, I mean, if you want to address adding a claim against them, you can. I mean, I don't want to take whatever you all let you, if you want to think that's a more important thing to talk about, I'll clear your case. The district court did, in fact, convert their motion to dismiss. They did have an opportunity. They actually participated in an oral argument 
Uh, was there any motion for a continuance to respond? There, there was no motion for a continuance, and it wasn't a matter of 28 days. It was a matter of several months during which they had the opportunity to uh, add in, to weigh in on their issues. They had the opportunity to ask for a continuance, which they never did. Now, the fact of the matter, I, as I read Syringa 1, this court was very specific, and it enumerated the counts in Syringa's complaint that it was dismissing. And it specifically- Actually, We didn't dismiss it, we upheld the trial court's dismissal. Excuse me, that is correct. Um, and it never, at any point, said all claims against ENA were dismissed. It never at any point said all claims against Quest were dismissed. It just, or rather, assisted, a, affirmed. Count three alleged an initial complaint didn't say anything against ENA. Count three in the original complaint attacked the amendments number one or the uh, Quest contract as amended. That is correct. Now, under the Uniform uh, Declaratory Judgments Act, necessary parties are parties that have an interest in whatever is the object of, of the motion for declaratory judgment. In this case, that contract was attached as Exhibit E to the original complaint. That contract very clearly involves the interest of Quest, and it also involves the interest of ENA. Amendment number one. There are two separate, there was a contract with Quest and a contract with ENA. That is correct. And the, if I remember correctly, in uh, uh, cause of action number th three, you only attacked the contract with Quest. Count three in the original complaint did, in fact, only attack the contract with the amended contract with Quest. However, that amended contract was attached to the complaint. And uh, that contract, in fact, sets out interests not just of Quest, but of ENA as well. Uh, ENA is mentioned eight to nine times in that, saying that um, ENA is the service provider listed on the state's federal E-rate 471. Uh, it says that Quest, in coordination, will deliver IEN technical network services. Uh, Quest, in coordination with ENA, will provide internet services. Quest project manager working with ENA project manager will develop a detailed joint project plan. And then I think, Your Honor, most importantly, uh, Quest and ENA will be treated as equal partners, which is provision eight of amendment number one. So that when the original complaint was filed, Quest and ENA were clearly parties to the proceeding of which count three was a part. Their interest was demonstrated in the complaint and in the attached exhibit, which was the contract with the amendment to Quest. So that when this court remanded count three for further proceedings, it necessarily had to include those parties that were interested or had an interest that would be addressed by the further proceedings in count three. And those parties were Quest and ENA. Before I leave the contract, in response to Quest's argument that uh, somehow this only relates to the school's part of the Idaho Education Network, um, the first page of the Quest contract at the record 000473 
um, under blanket comments. It says, contract for the benefit of the state of Idaho eligible schools, political subdivisions, or public, uh, public agencies as defined by Idaho Code Section 672327, which of course includes all the state agencies as well. So there was no division. The IEN request for proposals concerned services to schools and services to agents agencies. The original SBPOs concerned services to schools and services to agencies. The amendments number one did the very same thing and said among other things that only Quest would provide internet services to state agencies. <coughs> Mr. Patterson talked about querying versus querying and said that the, the concept that the court has an obligation to deal with illegal contracts doesn't apply in this case because, well, that, the facts were different. Many of the cases that the appellants have try to distinguish. They have distinguished on factual bases without really going to the legal principles that are driving the analysis. The legal principle in this case finds itself in two places. One, it finds itself in the common law. But secondly, and more importantly, these are public contracts. No matter what the body of common law is that governs contracts, in the case of public contracts, which are let and managed in the context of statutory pronouncements, statutory standards issued by the legislature of the state of Idaho, those statutes control. In this instance, those statutes were violated so that no matter how you try to distinguish, the fact of the matter is, based on the plain language of the SBPOs as amended, and the plain language of the statutes governing multiple awards and governing RFPs, the amendments and the contracts that they amended violate the provision, the procurement provisions of the Idaho Code. And Idaho Code section 6757.25 doesn't quibble about what happens if the procurement statutes are violated. If the procurement statutes are violated, the contract or agreement is void. And that is the case here. And it's consistent with querying versus querying. It's also consistent with uh, City of Meridian versus Petra and the duty of the court to raise the illegality of a contract, particularly a public contract, sui sponte. <clears throat> Syringa has <clears throat> asserted a cross appeal. The cross appeal really um, is part of uh, 
really the, the question concerning what do you do with Idaho Code Section 675725? The original complaint stated, I believe it was in paragraph 76, that the contracts violated 675725 and were void by operation of that provision. The district court, in its original dispositive decision, said that the provisions of 675725 will apply. But then the district court did not apply the provisions of 675725 beyond saying that the contracts are void, as amended, are void. Syringa's cross appeal and its request that the court amend the judgment relate solely to the operation of the statute. Once a contract is void, contract says, or rather the statute says, money advanced by the state of Idaho in consideration of any such contract or agreement shall be repaid forthwith. In the event of refusal or delay, when repayment is demanded by the proper officer of the state of Idaho, under whose authority such contract or agreement shall have been made or entered into, then prosecution can take place. Who is the proper officer of the state under whose authority the contract was entered? Is that the director of the Department of Administration or is somebody higher up? My interpretation of the statute and what I proposed to the district court was that it would be the purchasing manager who was responsible for the management and letting of the contracts. Does the purchasing manager have the right to implement a lawsuit to recover the amount? Who would that be? Mr. Chief Justice, my interpretation of the statute is that that would be handed over to the attorney general who would have the discretion as a prosecutor to determine whether and how to prosecute a collection suit. But we're ahead of ourselves in that the first thing that has to happen is a demand needs to be made. And what Syringa was requesting and would request of this court if this matter is remanded with direction is that the proper officer make demand. The demand is not expressly stated in the statute, but it is clearly implied that a demand is required to be made. So if a demand is made and Quest and ENA say, well, go fly a kite, what next? That is going to be a decision that's beyond Syringa's hands. That would be a decision. What effect would it have if the district court had said, yes, Syringa, you're right. I'm going to say they have to make a demand. So they do it. Nothing happens. So what? Well, the so what would be a problem for the attorney general, Mr. Chief Justice. But the important thing is that the statute, we're just talking about what happens, what's triggered by the determination that the contracts are void because they violate the procurement law. And the step after determining that the contracts are void is that there must be a determination whether monies were advanced. And if they were advanced, then a demand has to be made because they're required to be paid back forthwith. After that demand is made, it becomes a matter of prosecutorial discretion as to whether and how to pursue that. And we, Syringa, did not ask the court to go any further than to order that the demand be made as required by the statute. 
that does the statute kind of uh, suffice to do that? Mr. Chief Justice, with all due respect, I think that 57, 6757.18a was sufficient to put parties on notice that people who received multiple awards should be competitors. And that didn't suffice for the Department of Administration nor for the, for the appellants in this case. The history, with all due respect to all the parties here, has been that the law has not been adhered to. Well, it seems to me that the Department of Administration is in kind of a ticklish position. It could have uh, initially said, well, geez, things were not handled according to Hoyle, and it wasn't our fault. It was some agent that was working on our behalf. We'll turn state <coughs> evidence and say that this is uh, a bad contract, and we'll do it over, or they could resist, uh, which I guess they've decided to do, uh, till the bitter end, saying that nothing happened that was wrong here. So, I mean, I don't imagine that they're going to make any demand. Well, they've got uh, new leadership now, so maybe they would. I don't know. Mr. Chief Justice, that is precisely the reason why uh, we have brought this cross appeal and ask that they be ordered to determine whether demand must be made, whether monies were advanced, and to make the demand. I'm just curious, uh, you know, Syringa's not asking for any money. What do you get out of this lawsuit? Syringa has already received the opportunity to bid and to compete for uh, the ability to provide IEN services to schools and school districts and to state agencies. Uh, effective uh, in uh, 2015 after uh, the legislature shifted the monies from the Department of Administration uh, to the Department of Education and after these contracts were voided. So, and this is not in the record, but in response to your question, Your Honor, Syringa has had the opportunity not only to compete, but to uh, win some contracts and opportunities to provide service that was, they were precluded from enjoying and from even competing for as a consequence of the amendments. So yes, there is a reason for this. Syringa has gotten some benefit as a consequence of this. In fact, precisely as I believe the court contemplated in Syringa 1, because there was new bid competition Syringa participated, and it provided that part of the service, the telecommunications, that had been separately assigned to Quest in violation of the law. Thank you, Mr. Lombardi. Um, Mr. Clark, I understand you're going to do the final wrap-up. Uh, Mr. Clark, how much uh, time does Mr. Clark have? You may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, Justices of the Court, Counsel. I just very briefly touch on the response to the argument of Mr. Lombardi on cross appeal, on his cross appeal. Um, you know, if you take a, a close look at that statute, it doesn't require anyone to make a demand. Basically, it says if a demand is made, then it should be repaid. That's not what the district court was asked to do. Do you know who the proper officer is under that Well, statute? we contend in our briefing that it's the director of the Department of Administration because you can't have a purchase without a procurement authorization. That comes from the director of the department, of whatever department is making the procurement. In this case, it was the Department of Administration, so that would be the director. It's not anybody higher up in the structure? I no, I don't believe it is. The only one higher in the director would be the, the governor. How about my, the attorney general? Would the attorney general? No, I, I think that's unrelated. In fact, the person who really has the obligation to collect is a controller. If you look at the controller statutes, it says the controller has the duty to collect all debts owed to the state of Idaho. Mm -hmm. Now, the controller can utilize the services of the AG. But it's up to the controller to effect payment. 
repayment. If Maybe the controller is the proper person. Well, I, I certainly, I think the controller took that position. The controller could, could do that. I want to briefly address the issue of the law of the case. I mean, there's, we, we have briefed a lot of different issues that we think that, that justified the court's exercise of its discretion. <coughs> you know, we argue strenuously that the court acted as a valid exercise of the court's discretion in this case. There were issues of fact. There were issues of law. It hadn't even been pled. This particular claim for mandamus relief had never been pled. But it wasn't, and the court said, it's not before me. And the court was correct about that. And, and to top it off, the court didn't have jurisdiction over the, quote, proper officer. And that goes back to that case out of Lewiston where they were trying to get the clerk of the court to refund some funds. And this court said the district court had no authority to order the clerk of the court to refund anything because she was not a party to the lawsuit. She'd never been served. So there was no personal jurisdiction. And I know we didn't raise that below, but I don't think that matters. If you don't have personal jurisdiction, you don't have personal jurisdiction. So that's not something that can be weighed by failure to raise it. Well, it seems like it's just going through the motions because if all you have to do is make a demand and people say no, well, then so what? It serves no useful purpose, perhaps. On the law of the case, I mean, there's been an awful lot of argument, and I think it's important that this court make some clarification as to what is the law of this case as established in Syringa 1. Now, the issue before you then was standing. Did Syringa have standing? Had they exhausted administrative remedies? You ruled on that issue. That was the law of the case. You didn't rule that the contracts were void. You didn't rule that they were illegal. You ruled that Syringa had standing, and that was the law of the case. That was the only law of the case. I think I'd agree with you. I think we kind of implied that the contracts might be a little bit shaky, but I don't think we ruled specifically that that was the case. That is correct. That's my understanding as well from my reading of it. And yes, these are public contracts. We all acknowledge that, and they are controlled by the statutes. But if you look at the statutes, 6757.18a says that the purchasing department has the authority to issue multiple contracts as long as they're for same or similar services. That's what happened here. These awards were for same or similar services. And that was what was the standing. That was the issue, or that was actually the implied ruling of this court. Nobody challenged those the first time around. Then we get to the so-called amendments. 6718a subpart 3 says if you have multiple contracts, then the state must order goods and services in a manner that makes them the most advantageous to the state. That's the obligation. That was the obligation that the department had when it awarded the multiple contracts, was to award or make purchase orders in a manner that was the most advantageous to the state of Idaho. And that's what they did. Kind of like a Chinese menu? Yes. At the restaurant, you can pick, well, I want this from that award, and I want this from that award, and this from that award, and you're home free. Well, they reserved that right in the RFP. They said we can have multiple bidders. They said that three times in the RFP. And we can choose whether to order some, none, or all. So you can just kind of mix and match them however you want. It's a complex network. It's a very complex network. They didn't know what all they were going to get. You have to keep in mind. Should subsection 3 be read in connection with subsection 1? Can it be read into it? Should it be read in connection with subsection 1? Well, I think it should be read, yes, in connection with where you have multiple awards. With the same or similar services, if you award two contracts or to two bidders, then would you say, okay, for this service, what would you cost, what would you cost, and do it that way as opposed to, well, you can do one thing and you can do an entirely separate thing. Well, the way it happened is the first way you stated it, Justice Eisenman. What the amendment said was never implemented. The way the work was divided was never implemented that way. The way it was implemented after Laura got done and Mr. Zickow, and by the way, it was Mr. Zickow and Laura 
who were the architects of this pro project. They were the ones responsible for implementing it. And the way they did it was they decided that ENA had the most experience and was most advantageous to the state to use ENA for E-rate services to the schools. Remember, you also then had the agencies. They weren't part of the schools. So they said, in that situation, it's most advantageous for the, uh, the connectivity to be done by Quest, and they can do the agencies as well. But I think you'll find in the record, if you look at all the affidavits that we submitted and all the briefing we did on the motion for reconsideration of summary judgment, we went to great lengths to explain how this program was implemented. And it was implemented by using ENA as the primary contractor because they had the best pricing. And it was necessary to have the best pricing to satisfy E-rate, the federal funding. And that's why we're here. That is a huge issue for the state of Idaho. Serena doesn't get anything out of it. They've already had the right to rebid. The IEN's done. The legislature decided not to refund it. The reason we're here is to try and get a ruling that these contracts, when you look at how they were actually implemented, were lawful. And that's what we're asking this court to declare. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clark. This case has been fully submitted in due course and opinion will issue. I want to thank all of the council. Good case.